Welcome, 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 welcome to the 2021 Dissemination and Implementation Short Course hosted by University of Wisconsin-Madison. I am Mondir Sahamal Downey. I'm the manager of Dissemination and Implementation Launchpad, which is bringing you the short course today. I'm so glad you'll be spending the next couple of days with us, what seems to be going to be a phenomenal two days of extreme of extraordinary knowledge that you'll gain. So I'm going to go to some of the things that you should remember for the next two days. We are on a Zoom webinar platform right now. Um, so your videos and microphones are not on. Do take advantage of the breaks. All times indicated are US Central Standard Time. And I would like to thank all the speakers and volunteers. One of the things for Zoom webinars is that please put your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar. You will see that at the bottom of your screen. If you have technical issues or logistical issues, please use the chat function, which gets directly funneled to our uh, IT folks. We will do a few polls and other activities. We will use Mentee and also Zoom polling. Our Mentee uh, code is 4402-6147. And if you want to download Mentee, you can either put it on your laptops or computers, menti.com, or download the app on your smartphones, or even the QR code at the bottom of the screen, you can scan that with your smartphone and it will directly go into the Menti app. Then let me give you a couple of seconds to do that. And then let's test this out. Why don't you put in Menti the state or country where you're from and the current weather there? Welcome Memphis, welcome Phoenix. Welcome Marshfield, welcome Oakland, welcome Ann Arbor, Seattle, welcome Oregon, San Diego. Wow, we have people from all over the world joining us today and we're so delighted to have you. Since you've gotten the hang of Menti, I'm going to move on and go through um, the agenda for the next two days. I will be followed by Dr. Jane Mahoney, who is our esteemed director at DNI Launchpad. And then after that, we have two phenomenal speakers, Dr. Greg Ahrens, who will talk about EPIS, and tomorrow, Dr. Lisa Saldana will talk about second coins. We, then we'll have a short break following. We will have um, a case study panel with some luminaries, Dr. Michelle Chewy, uh, Dr. Melissa Datalo, and Ms. Chris Krasnowski. And then we'll have a break and that will end the Zoom webinar. Again, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function. And if you have technical issues, please use the chat function. After the break, we will move on to a different platform, the Zoom meeting, separate link um, was emailed to all of you. And at that point, we will do breakout rooms and breakout sessions where you will be applying the knowledge you gained this morning from Dr. Ahrens and the panelists. Please do stay for the networking sessions at the end of the day. Um, it's going to be very casual um, and it's going to be more of having conversations or questions if you want to ask questions with Dr. Ahrens or Dr. Soldana and the rest of the team. This is also an opportunity for you to connect with your colleagues. We'll have breakout rooms that you could enter at any time or leave or have separate conversations. This is a time for you. Tomorrow we'll duplicate what we are doing today, except we are going to showcase Dr. Lisa Soldana, who's going to talk about sick and the coins model, then a break, and then some phenomenal panelists, Dr. Jay Ford and Dr. Andrew Kwan back are going to take the stage. In the evening, after the webinar, we'll do the breakout rooms again, where you will be applying sick and coins concepts, and then do stay for the morning emerging topics in DNI. This is going to be very thrilling. 
and, uh, Dr. Soldan and Dr. Aaron's are going to talk about the breakthrough research in this field. Today's session is going to be moderated by Dr. Jane Mahoney, and tomorrow's session is going to be moderated by Dr. Heidi Brown. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jane. Welcome, Jane. Greetings. We're so excited to have um, so many people here for our 2021 DNI short course. So I'm the director of the Dissemination Implementation Launchpad um, here in our uh, Clinical and Translational Science Award Hub, which we call Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context about our, uh, our team, our university, and Wisconsin, and um, then uh, introduce our speakers for the short course. So here's our DNI Launchpad team. Um, we have a background that includes clinical uh, expertise, engineering, especially systems engineering, business and education. Uh, Dr. Heidi Brown, who will be facilitating, moderating tomorrow. Sheena Hirschfield, behind the scenes, making everything work. Thank you, Sheena. Uh, Rachel Maline, again, behind the scenes as our administrative specialist. Thank you. Andrew Kwanbeck from Systems Engineering, uh, one of our uh, DNI Launchpad faculty. Felice Resnick, who is our assistant scientist, and she'll be moderating some of the Q and the question and answer following um, the various sessions. And Mandira Saha Muldowney, the leader of our team and our uh, manager with a background in business. So our DNI Launchpad provides uh, education, this short course, a number of other workshops designed for dissemination tools, which you'll find on our website and um, we provide consultation and to support dissemination implementation research, uh, consulting with our uh, ICTER uh, collaborators and investigators. And finally, we provide implementation support and award to help scale up innovations, um, proven innovations into practice through, it's called the Evidence to Implementation Award. And we also support uh, development of toolkits and other materials to uh, launch innovations into practice. I want to give a big thank you to our um, staff and volunteers helping today, um, and a special recognition to Kate Judge, Jen Kalias, Brianna Kleinfeld, Rose Hennessy Garza, and Brian Dygate. Thank you for your support behind the scenes for all of the short course. And then um, we'd like to thank the Wisconsin Partnership Program and our funding for our CTSA from the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. Context, implementation science is all about context. Here's our context in the University of Wisconsin-Madison, founded in 1848. Um, a land that was originally inhabited by the Ho-Chunk and other indigenous nations. We have 20 schools and colleges, uh, 45,000 students. Um, you can see some of our other rankings and um, Pulitzer Prize winners, Nobel Prize winners. But the fun fact is that in January uh, 29, 2019, Kansas classes were canceled, which really never happens because due to minus 40 degree uh, Fahrenheit weather. So um, we're all about the Wisconsin idea, which is getting innovations out to uh, benefit the people of the state and beyond. And this DNI short course is part of that. Moving in from the UW-Madison, we are part of the UW Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. Um, the goal of that is to uh, transform research so that uh, we can move from investigation through discovery to translation into real life practice um, to improve human health. ICTER is, uh, involves uh, five 
schools and colleges at UW-Madison and our other partner is the Marshfield Clinic Research Institute located in the middle of our state. And it's supported by NCATS, the Wisconsin Partnership Program and UW Health. Turning to our short course, we have 450 plus attendees representing 19 countries and 36 states. 70% uh, are coming for attending for the first time. Welcome, and we hope you continue to attend. Um, most of our uh, participants are, are from academic institutions. And um, in terms of self-rating of DNI research skills, almost half at the beginner level and about 41% at intermediate level. We're representing uh, 75 uh, participants from 30 CTSAs. So welcome to all of you. And this map shows where uh, participants are from. And uh, we especially appreciate those who are in sleep time zone on the other side of the world and um, just uh, very glad to have uh, people from all over. So I'd like to introduce our uh, guest faculty. First of all, today we will um, hear from Dr. Greg Ahrens and Dr. Lisa Saldana will also join us for the discussion and uh, the Q&A. So Dr. Ahrens is a clinical and organizational psychologist, a professor of psychiatry at UC San Diego, where he is director of the Child and Adolescent Services Research Center and co-director of the UCSD ACTRI DNI Science Center. He is a co-developer of the EPIS framework, which we are just um, honored to be able to hear about today uh, and have as the focus for our uh, day one agenda. His work focuses on aligning and testing leadership and organization development strategies to support implementation of evidence-based practices and, and their sustainment in health, focusing on behavioral health. Dr. Lisa Saldana will um, join us today in the discussion and then we will feature her tomorrow in a discussion of stages of implementation completion and cost of implementing new strategies of SICK and COIN tools. Dr. Saldana is a senior scientist at the Oregon Social Learning Center, and where she has a research emphasis in evidence-based practice in public serving systems. Um, her research addresses the needs of families involved in the child welfare system. She is a primary developer of SICK and COINS, which are measures to um, uh, help uh, measure and track implementation process, milestones in resource use. And these tools have been used to track over 1900 implementations of uh, different uh, programs worldwide. So I'd like to thank both our speakers and uh, we are so grateful to have you and appreciate um, Dr. Greg Ahrens, who's going to kick us off. You need to unmute. I know, I know, <laughs> multitasking here, getting my slides up. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've been kidding with um, with folks. I need to get a T-shirt that says uh, "You're muted" or "Please unmute," so <laughs> I could benefit from that. So, thank you so much for having me. Um, very excited to be part of this, and especially co-presenting and and uh, with Lisa and working with you all at uh, University of Wisconsin and. Um, actually been out there to Madison and um, presented and have uh, gotten to know some of you and uh, Dr. Kwanbeck in particular extremely well over the last few years. 
So I'm going to be talking about the EPIS framework, exploration, preparation, implementation, system framework, a little bit about the development of the framework and how it's been adapted. And I, I thought that could be useful in thinking about how you take a framework and tailor adapt it for your purposes. So I, I think some examples of that might be helpful in, in thinking that through. So first, um, I want to acknowledge the support uh, that I've had uh, and the support for the EPIS development as well. Uh, and you can see over on the right, the you know, NIMH, uh, NIDA, uh, NICHD, the Fogarty International Center, CDC, and the WT Grant Foundation. We've had funding where we've either used the EPIS framework um, from all those institutes um, and in particular, I uh, want to shout out to the NIMH uh, that supported the development of EPIS framework through a grant to John Landsvert, um, who is now at the Oregon Social Learning Center. Um, and that grant uh, provided the, the support for the development of the framework. And then over the development of EPIS and our, our work in the field, have a lot of collaborators. Uh, Mike Hurlburt and Sally Horwitz in particular in, in the development of the framework, but then a number of other investigators in the US, Australia, and working in um, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, that have led to additional developments of the EPIS framework. So the roadmap for today is really to think about, um, you know, the, the origins of the EPIS framework. Um, and then I'll talk about a systematic review that, that we did and how that changed um, things and helped develop the framework further. Those examples that I mentioned of adaptations and application in large scale and other trials, and then some new developments in terms of uh, EPIS framework constructs. So, you know, why EPIS? Uh, there are many, many frameworks uh, to consider that could be used. Uh, in fact, Rachel Tabak and colleagues identified and reviewed over 61 frameworks, but we think there are more than 100 now. Um, but it really comes down to utility. How useful is a framework uh, in implementation science for the work that you're doing? It's not just that you need one in a grant application or to frame your work but how can it be useful in identifying uh, the factors, determinants, and mechanisms that will be important in implementation and also for tracking uh, the progress of your work and staging the work that you're doing. And I think EPIS has some real advantages in that regard as well. So uh, EPIS is, both a determinant and process framework. And that means that determinants are essentially what are the predictors of implementation outcomes. Uh, so it has constructs with specific factors or determinants, um, but it's also a process framework uh, because it also helps to stage the process. There are key phases, exploration phase, preparation phase, implementation phase, and sustainment phases that help us think broadly about the implementation process. EPIS is multi-level, covering both the outer system context and inner organizational context. And it frames implementation determinants and mechanisms. And when I say mechanisms, I mean you know, mediators and moderators of outcomes across levels. So across outer and inner context within each phase and really enumerates or identifies those common and unique determinants and mechanisms across level and across phases. And it does allow for what we call a recursive process. So for example, you, know, you may have gone through exploration and preparation phases and you're in implementation, and then things aren't working quite as you thought, you might have to go back and do some more preparation. So that's the sort of re recursive piece of, of EPIS. So we have a quick poll. This will be um, a poll within Zoom. Uh, if you could just answer the question, how familiar are you with the EPIS framework? Are you exploring, preparing to use it, implementing it now, um, or have you been using it and are sustaining it? So 
So we'll give you just a minute to respond. And Sheena, maybe you can tell me when we have enough responses. Okay, so 84% uh, said exploring EPIS, getting to know EPIS. So that's great to know. Some preparing to use EPIS, so I've been thinking about it. Others actually using it in, in uh, projects. And then some who are sort of experts been using it for a while. So thank you, thank you for responding to the poll. That's really helpful. So um, I do want to uh, mention the episframework.com website. Um, it's a great resource for you if you're thinking about using, you know, you can glean some from the publications about EPIS and examples. Uh, the uh, website goes through the constructs, goes through the phases, but also provides some resources and tools, including measures for some of the constructs uh, that you can use. So it's, uh, there are also some webinars about EPIS specifically um, that were done for NIH and, and other folks. So you can really um, get more familiar with the framework and kind of explore it a little more uh, on the website. So in the original development of the framework, um, Mike Hurlburton, Sally Horwitz, and I reviewed the literature on implementation in public sector service systems. And we were really focusing on those public sector systems. That's where our funding for the development uh, came from with that focus. Um, and we identified in the literature really this notion that you know, when you think about public sector services, uh, and I'll talk more how this extends to other health services and hospital systems, for example, but there's this outer context that contains the service environment, right? Policies, practices, funding, things like that in the services environment that can affect implementation. Um, there's a relationship of organizations um, in the outer context, for example, you know, if we think about, you know, Medicaid, there's, um, you know, federal Medicaid, but there's also state Medicaid offices and how those come together. So there's interorganizational connections. And when we think about the outer context where we're working, you know, what are the population needs, the needs of patients and consumers? Um, is there support? Is there advocacy going on in those settings? In the inner context, you know, we're thinking about what is going on, what are the processes, workflows, dynamics within organizations or intra-organizational characteristics. And then importantly, within those organizations, there's the individual adopter characteristics. And that includes, you know, leaders, managers, clinicians um, who are sort of responsible for bringing in new evidence-based interventions, evidence-based practices. And then when we think about the innovations that we're bringing in, this could be something like medication assisted treatment and addiction, or it could be cognitive behavioral therapy, or it could be um, innovations to address chronic diseases like diabetes, diabetes or obesity. Um, so what are the characteristics of those interventions and how do the intervention developers really assess and understand the implementability of their innovations. And then we think about, you know, how the practices, the innovations, evidence-based practices fit at the system and organization level. And then how are inner and outer context, how are these all connected? So when we developed EPIS, these were the main constructs that we were thinking about and that we identified in the literature review but we also framed it in terms of the four phases. So as we think about the exploration phase, where you're really working with stakeholders, thinking about what are the health issues that you want to address? What are the constraints at the outer and inner context um, that might be important in that? Who are the stakeholders who should be at the table? Um, we identified a number of 
constructs, socio-political context, funding, advocacy, organizational networks, in the outer context, and organizational characteristics, culture, climate, leadership, um, knowledge, skills, readiness for change, um, and individual adopter characteristics, for example, their values, goals, social networks, perceived need for change. So this is just to give you a, a, a taste of the kinds of things that may be occurring in outer context and inner context to consider. And in any implementate, particular implementation project, you may focus on one or two or three uh, of these. So pre-assessment and understanding in the exploration phase is really important. In the preparation phase, we again consider these dynamics at the outer and inner context. And so we go through that same process of saying, what did we learn in exploration? In the preparation phase, we're thinking about, okay, with what we know, with what we've identified, how do we now prepare? How do we address those? What will our implementation strategies be uh, to affect change when we go to implementation? So for example, you may have identified um, you know, policies at a system level uh, in, the, in the preparation phase. Can you bring policymakers on board to think about how to support implementation to address a specific health concern uh, with a specific evidence-based practice? Uh, in the inner context, you know, you may have identified that leadership could be strengthened to really focus on championing adoption of new practices. So your implementation strategy could then be a leadership development approach. Uh, and then, so that work from the exploration and preparation phases brings you to the implementation phase where you say, okay, we've identified the issues, we've prepared, we have our strategies. Now we are going to implement and test those strategies. And if we're effective, hopefully we will get to sustainment. And I like to say that we should begin any implementation project with the idea of sustainment in mind really thinking about that long-term, uh, how we're going to get to those results that are gonna to lead to improved quality of care, improved care practices, and better outcomes for patients and clients. So we published EPIS in 2011, but then a lot of work had been done uh, with the EPIS framework. So um, with colleagues and, and the systematic review, that we conducted was led by a Joanna Mullen, who's a, a pharmacist and lecturer in, at Curtin University in Perth, Australia now. We undertook a systematic review to understand how EPIS was being used. And that through that review, we identified that EPIS was being used in 11 different countries, many different public sectors, um, but also in many physical health settings, health clinics, women's reproductive health clinics, um, and also other settings um, that were not directly health, but provided some services such as schools and child welfare agencies, substance use treatment programs and other CBOs. So a broad representation. I don't wanna go into much detail about the review, but um, as with many systematic reviews, it's a rather intense and lengthy process, but. It was really great to learn about um, all the things that were going on in different countries and uh, with EPIS. And what that led us to is a revised uh, version of the EPIS framework. And we tried to put the phases sort of wrapped around the constructs uh, as we tried to illustrate you know, what we found in EPIS. And so the first thing you'll note is that you know, in the different dimensions, there uh, there's a little more detail. So in terms of outer context system level, you know, we identified a number of sort of buckets of issues. So leadership, the service environment and policies, funding and contracting, again, those inter-organizational environment networks, the patient and client characteristics, if we're taking a public health approach, thinking about the health needs in a catchment area, for example and still patients, client, and advocacy still present. In the inner context, we also uh, 
provide a little more detail here uh, in terms of identifying issues such as leadership, the organizational characteristics, for example, culture and climate of those organizations, whether there's existing quality uh, monitoring and support and fidelity monitoring and support, staffing and work processes, and then really those individual differences of people in those inner contexts across levels of those organizations. So it could be executives, middle managers, such as the work by Sarah Bergen and colleagues, um, and first level leaders who lead um, clinic operations, for example. In terms of the innovation factors, um, this developed uh, a little bit more in terms of thinking about that innovation system fit, uh, but also fit with the organization, fit with providers, fit with patients, fit with clients. What are the consumer or patient preferences in terms of uh, practices, interventions that they would be engaging with? Uh, again, relationships with EBP developers and characteristics of the interventions still important. But something that emerged more clearly, uh, and I'll talk more about this in a bit, is this idea of bridging factors. What are the ways in which outer context and inner context are linked? And some of what we found in the review was that this happens through community academic partnerships and also intermediary or purveyor organizations who sort of bridge that divide, work in between sort of policy and practice. So I'll talk more about bridging factors because it's a really rapidly developing area uh, for FS. Uh, and the other thing that I, I wanted to, to note, I, you know, I've, mentioned that EPIS is a process model and we think about process as you know, exploration, preparation, implementation, sustainment, but EPIS also acknowledges interconnections, interactions, linkages, and relationships that occur among organizations, among people, different stakeholders. And so implementation is extremely dynamic. And so we wanna capture that in EPIS that it's, you know, you know, for a grant proposal or something, we may want to say, you know, there's this construct, this determinant, this predictor, this mechanism, this mediator or moderator that will lead to outcomes. Uh, but there's a lot of nuance that goes on in relationships and as you're implementing. And I'm sure that many of you have experienced this as you've sort of gone forward and, and engaged in thinking about bringing in evidence-based practices, improving quality of care. So we just want to acknowledge that in the EPIS framework as well. So I want to talk a little bit about how EPIS has been adapted in different studies. So I'm going to go fairly quickly, but um, these slides will be available and this webinar will be available um, after, after the um, short course in due time, so you'll be able to, to review. But I'm really excited to talk about some of these adaptations because um, investigators, researchers, practitioners are being, I think, really creative in how they use and adapt the EPIS framework. So the first example was a um, systematic review that I was involved in with, led by Doug Novins, who's a child psychiatrist at the University of Colorado. And we're thinking about, you know, what has been done in terms of implementation, dissemination and implementation in children's mental health. And so the systematic review helped narrow that big sort of laundry list of constructs of determinants and mechanisms in EPIS to what we were finding in the literature in uh, children's mental health. And so you can see those numbers of constructs are reduced because this is what was reflected in the literature. And this can be a really good way to think about what constructs will be available or, or be relevant for your work, reviewing the literature, but also based on your knowledge and hopefully having stakeholder input into what's important uh, in a given setting. All right, so, so those partnerships and collaborations can be really important in identifying things. So you can see these 
reduced number of constructs, but things like internet use, insurance availability in the outer context, um, in the inner context, you know, the EBP fit with client and the fiscal viability um, of interventions in a given setting. How much does it cost? Can we support it? And you might guess that, you know, it might relate to things like insurance availability or funding from the outer context. So these were carried through uh, in thinking about in the different phases, what was important. So this is just one example of a way to think about you know, really honing in on the important constructs for a given process or a given project. Um, this team's project is from Lauren Brookman Frizzi and, and Aubin Stommer. Uh, Lauren's here at UC San Diego, Aubin Stommer is at the University of California, Davis. And they have these linked um, large grants to test a leadership focused implementation strategy to implement autism spectrum disorders uh, in schools and in community mental health. So Aubin is uh, leading the school-based um, uh, grant and Lauren is leading the community-based. And so you can see that they've identified one, here's the innovation, the autism intervention on the outer context, the server environment is the mental health system for Lauren's or in the school system for Auburn and looking at the influences of leadership and the structure of those organizations. In the inner context, looking at program or school district factors, the role of leadership, provider characteristics, and client characteristics. Uh, and then looking at the EBI, ever evidence-based intervention fit, um, which was developed on, based on needs assessment and collaboration with end users. And we've done this in another project, but I, I really like to see this here. So listing the implementation outcomes that you expect. So you can add that into EPIS and think about, we have these determinants, mechanisms, and what are our expected implementation outcomes. So this is a real nice way to illustrate that in this project. And they also thought about how you use the phases in the preparation phase, when it's occurring, what happens in the implementation phase, and how we know when we've come to the sustainment phase. So really identifying what signals movement through those phases. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more, a little bit today, um, regarding the stages of implementation completion and how that's been used in uh, projects and overlaid with EPIS, but thinking about, you know, how and when do we move through those phases is important. And then again, another summary of the determinants that they've identified. Uh, another example is on a collaborative project uh, called the Bridge Collaboration, uh, which is also one of Aubin and, and Lauren's projects, and Sarah Reith, who's the lead author. They've identified the stages across here, and then clearly thinking about implementation strategies. So what strategies will be used in exploration, preparation, implementation, sustainment phase in the outer context and inner context? So this is really a useful way to say, what are the strategies we're going to be using through these different phases, and you can sort of clearly um, identify and communicate how those strategies fit within outer and inner context uh, and how they go across the phases. So this is a really nice example, I think, as well. Um, a really recent project, and this is um, Alex Dopp at RAND. Um, is just starting this um, NIDA funded grant comparing two financing strategies to look at treatment penetration and sustainment. So this is really looking at implementation phase and sustainment phase. And some of, uh, some of the sort of organization systems um, had different approaches towards financing. Some where grants were focused on the organization level. Others where financing was focused at the state level. 
And so the goal of this is using EPIS is to think about, you know, inner context within organization financing strategy, outer context financing strategy of state behavioral health agencies. And how do those financing strategies and inner context strategy versus an outer context strategy lead to more effective implementation and sustainment through the process? So this is a really nice use of EPIS in thinking about that broadly in terms of a higher level outer context policy, inner context organization strategy. Um, Joanna Mullen, who I mentioned before, developed a community pharmacy implementation framework and integrated some of the aspects of EPIS. And, and really like formation and development would be sort of um, early pre-exploration, then thinking about exploration phase uh, in terms of pharmacy recruitment, co-prescribing dissemination, preparing um, and pharmacist training and champion implementation training, although I might consider this to be implementation phase. But I think what the attempt here was to think about an implementation framework that's going to be sensitive to the context of community pharmacy. And so this was a nice uh, effort, nice um, work uh, from Joanna to really develop this and think about what it takes to effectively implement in community pharmacy. And um, so just quickly, you know, the exploration, preparation, sort of testing and implementation phases are represented in her um, figure here, leading to sustainment or sustainability. Um, but also you can see in here, you know, system level, local setting, the pharmacy, which would be in her organizational context, and individuals within a pharmacy service or a pharmacy, for example. So we see sort of elements of EPIS within the community pharmacy framework. One of the best examples I think of applying EPIS was in the uh, JJ Trials Initiative. This was a large project funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse and it involved six NIDA funded centers with 36 sites and was collaboration between juvenile justice, community-based health organizations and researchers. And the goal here was to test two implementation strategies, a core implementation strategy um, that was included a needs assessment, data feedback report, behavioral health training and goal achievement, and then an enhanced strategy that had all of the core implementation components, but added local change teams, facilitators, additional ongoing support and facilitator training. So this was a, a large um, project and um, the six funded centers you know, agreed on these approaches, the core and enhanced strategy, and also on utilizing EPIS in the process. And so EPIS was used in a number of ways. So for example, when we think about the core intervention and the enhanced intervention, you know, what are those components and when do they occur in the phases? So you can see across the top here, exploration, preparation, implementation, sustainment. So in exploration, um, these core interventions were provided for all of the sites. In the preparation phase, some additional core intervention uh, activities were provided, but then additional uh, enhanced intervention elements were added in, and those were continued in the implementation phase. And then in the sustainment phase, there were no activities, just measurement. So this is a nice way to sort of lay out how your implementation strategy is being done. So kind of similar to what we saw in that slide by Sarah Reef. Uh, and this is where we think about where we transition through the EPIS phases. And it's not always this clear, but um, Lisa Sodana was also involved in thinking through these issues. So when we think about the 
stages of implementation, completion stages, the six stages, you know, where do they occur? And for this project, um, the JJ Trials Collaborative decided that exploration phase was you know, really this number one um, part of the SICK, right? Site engagement, the needs assessment, behavioral health training, goal achievement. Um, in the pre preparation phase, the next two stages of the SICK. Um, and then uh, stage four, moving us to the implementation phase. And stage five, six, and seven of the SICK, really moving us through the implementation phase into sustainment. So, you know, it's it's not perfect. And, you know, we debated like what stage goes where. And so there may be some fluidity to that, but it's a nice way to think about, you know, how do we one decide when we move from each of the EPIS phase to the next EPIS phase and using the SICK, can we provide more nuance and help have data to move that process forward. And um, Lisa will talk much more about this tomorrow and, and give you a lot of information about how, how the SICK is framed, how to use it, and how it might be flexibly applied. Um, EPIS was also used in terms of the measurement plan, what measures uh, were going to be uh, assessed or collected at each time point. Um, so that you know the main primary questions, the main outcomes, receipt of services, service quality, and staff use, exploratory questions, and the mediators and moderators, or what I've called the mechanisms. When will they be measured as well? So you can use EPIS to really lay those issues out as you go forward in thinking about you know, staging your study design uh, and how you're going to communicate what you're actually doing. And then as a measurement framework, you know, we're thinking about it for JJ trials in terms of what is going to be um, measured at these different phases um, and for what purpose, right? So exploring issues at the system level, the community level, the organization level, the staff level, and the client level. So these are sort of the buckets of the different measures and you know, all to be collected, exploration, targeted assessment in preparation, implementation, and sustainment. And the idea here is to be as comprehensive as possible while also reducing the burden of measurement for participants and participant organizations. As we were meeting and talking about you know, the EPIS framework and how it would fit for JJ trials, I was sitting next to a, a juvenile justice system leader and we were we were chatting and she said, you know, I, I like EPIS, I think it fits, but, you know, in my experience, things happen and they happen again, we revisit, we recycle, we go on. Uh, and it's, it really is a more of a cyclical, cyclical process. And so as we were talking, I drew this diagram. I said, you mean something like this? Would this get at kind of what you're thinking about? And she said, yeah, I think so. And so we worked through this and worked through with our NIDA program officer as well um, for this uh, EPIS adapted for JJ trials as a cyclical process. So we still have uh, you know, the phases, exploration, preparation, implementation, sustainment that occurs with outer context and inner context. Um, the goal of improving youth client outcomes was the, at the center, at the core of this. But these other activities, research, um, advocacy, engagement with service systems, engagement with service providers was important. And when I talked about the sort of processes, the things that happen uh, during implementation, this idea that we're you know, collaborating, but often collaboration involves negotiation of organization and individual sort of needs and preferences. And how do we come together? How do we coalesce in that process? So we try to represent that here and that we promote entering into implementation with the collaborative problem-solving orientation. 
as we think about how we get through the implementation process. So um, this was sort of the adaptation. And what JJ Trials did was to build this in to the phases and say, where do we think that the cyclical process is going to occur most? Probably between the preparation and implementation phases, because we've done all of prep, we start implementing, and then we say, oh, now we've identified some other nuance, some other need that we need to address. And so it's important to think about how we track our adaptations to our implementation strategy so we can report on those. And um, Aaron Finley and Allison Hamilton published a nice paper um, that really talked about this idea of doing uh, periodic reflections about the implementation process, which is a structured qualitative approach to document uh, any adaptations or tailoring. And then the work of Shannon Sturman and colleagues with their um, approach they call the FRAME, F-R-A-M-E uh, approach to really clearly identifying why, where, and when adaptations are made can be really important. So uh, I'll move on to another example of uh, EPIS. And this was a project we did with NIMH funding and, and actually some CDC funding as well. Um, this notion of interagency collaborative teams as a scale up strategy. So, and their question was, how can we efficiently scale up evidence-based practice across an entire child welfare service system? And this was done in San Diego County, which is the sixth um, largest county uh, in the country and one of the larger child welfare systems as well. And uh, our question was, how can we be efficient? So how can we create local expertise in an evidence-based intervention? In this case, it was a child neglect intervention called Safe Care. And we did that through developing a seed team that was trained by the intervention developers to certification and then would provide training for teams within the child welfare system rolling out across the entire home visitation system. But this was a, a project that you know, invoked the intervention developers, also outer context, the United Way providing startup funding, the child welfare system, collaborating. Um, and this is why it's interagency. We had the child welfare system, we had the United Way, we had community-based provider organizations in coming to an agreement about a strategy to scale up, efficiently roll out and maintain fidelity through the rollout process by having local expertise that not only did training, but also provided fidelity assessment and coaching as it rolled out. So we frame this in outer and inner context, outer context of the child welfare system and United Way, but the inner context of the organizations and teams providing care. And so in the phases, we thought about an exploration practice fit to local context, the funding that would be needed to implement and sustain, um, preparing cross-level leadership and system, United Way, community-based organization level, effective EBP developer involvement. So the EBP developers trained the local team and then gradually withdrew, coordinated communication and those inter-organizational networks because the teams that were providing care were made up of inter-agencies, multiple agencies, multiple community-based organizations. And so there were a number of activities, education, um, stakeholder development, practice fit assessment, resource supports, focusing on fidelity all the way through, skill development and monitoring feedback. So it's framed activities within EPIS um, and through multiple dimensions. Uh, and then we also 
looked at fidelity for this and identified the processes that would help lead to more effective fidelity and exploration, preparation phases, um, two phases of implementation, and then sustainment. And this project led to sustainment of this practice in the system now for over six years and still going strong as one of the core evidence-based practices. So I just wanna give a shout out to Dylan Wong at Oregon Social Learning Center, who also provided a, a really nice figure here for thinking about how the stages of implementation completion overlap and fit with uh, the EPIS framework. And so this will be sort of forthcoming work, but it's also work that we've been thinking about and, and working with Lisa Sagana and the Oregon Social Learning Center for some time on multiple projects. So this is a really nice just sort of illustration of how you can think about uh, overlap of the SIC and EPIS. Uh, another adaptation I wanted to talk about briefly, uh, this is the Youth Forward study in Sierra Leone, uh, where Teresa Betancourt at Boston College um, with NIMH support and um, GIZ uh, public funder from Germany thought about addressing the needs of youth in Sierra Leone, um, youth who have experienced trauma through the civil war there, through the Ebola crisis, and now through COVID. Um, and this was a unique, interesting project. Um, it uses EPIS, primarily exploration and preparation phases in thinking about proactive problem solving in the conceptualization and initial development, but then adapting the interagency collaborative team scale-up strategy for rolling out um, the youth forward or the youth readiness uh, intervention that Teresa developed um, to test in the implementation phase in Sierra Leone. And so the uh, Teresa's team thought about, well, what's the language? And you know, we say outer context, inner context. Well, the language, uh, you know, what would make sense for people in Sierra Leone is thinking about this outer circle and the inner circle. So you can adapt your framework you know, for the language of a community and, and think about how that might make sense um, given the perspectives of folks that we're collaborating with. And thinking about things like you know, health ministries, uh, funding and services in continuity and the NGO networks within a country and how that can support uh, scale up. And then the need for and buy-in for what, we, what Teresa calls alternative delivery platforms. So working with NGOs that maybe had focused primarily on HIV, can they be trained in doing in uh, psychosocial and employment uh, strategy for youth, uh, thinking about their readiness for change, their context, the leadership uh, within those agencies. And then you know, the individual adopter characteristics, those who would do those trainings, you know, what are their goals? What are their values and motivation? And thinking about that through, through the phases. So Teresa's group did a really nice job in, in adapting this. And then building on some work we did in thinking about dynamic adaptation uh, we developed this dynamic adaptation process, thinking about you know, doing pre-assessment of outer and inner context in the exploration phase. In the preparation phase, really bring together an implementation resource team that involves your important stakeholders, an advisory committee, leadership team, co-investigators, trainers, youth, um, facilitators, um, who has a stake in this? And can they be involved in thinking about the rollout? And so that becomes a core feature through implementation and sustainment phase, um, where in sustainment and getting towards sustainment, data that's collected could be fed back to the implementation resource team to think about, are there adaptations that need to be made as we're rolling out cross country? So this is a really nice example of another adaptation of at this framework. Uh, and before we finish up, I wanted to focus on this idea of bridging factors. And I mentioned at the beginning that this is where a lot of work um, is being done. 
uh, by our group and also led by Rebecca Lynn McCall, who is at Washington University in St. Louis, who's really sort of taken this on. And again, those bridging factors are those that cross or link outer system and inner organizational context. And this came to the fore um, in, back in 2016, the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, was awarded for work on contracts. And one of the things that we've identified as a bridging factor is this idea of contracts. How do policymakers really communicate what's expected, supported, what's, what's funded? Um, and that's often done through contracts. So, you know, we looked at contracting and procurement um, and contracting as a bridging, bridging factor. So it's, you know, one of these new emerging bridging factors, those formalized structured policy approaches um, and approaches that can communicate a strategic initiative. But also when you think about the inner context, how do inner context organizations, individuals influence policy through advocacy uh, and through other activities. So it really can be bi-directional. So as I mentioned, you know, Rebecca has been working on this and um, most recently uh, in this year, led a paper on this idea of forms and functions. So you know, a function um, could be to communicate the importance of initiative, forms it may take could be policy directives, it could be funding, it could be collaboratives, lots of ways that a specific function can, can operate. Um, so, you know, our goal was to identify more types and examples and explore nuances. And we identified this idea of bridging factors can be relational, relational ties, they could be formal arrangements, and they can be processes. Um, and so in this uh, paper, we used a purpose of case study sampling for diversity across EBP context and bridging factor types. We identified for relational ties, you know, partnerships between local government uh, in LMICs and churches, for example, partnerships um, between public sector system and local organizations, interagency collaboration, partnerships between state and local agencies and individual connected university medical centers with the state run prison, for example, uh, in programming for pregnant and postpartum women. So there are many forms that relational ties can take. And so we'd be looking forward to hearing from you all <laughs> about what you think are important relational ties. Also formal arrangements, um, and those can be contracting arrangements, policy driven fiscal incentives, uh, or, for example, earmarked taxes that connect state and local organizations could be examples of formal arrangements. And processes could be things like, you know, data sharing that connect local and state health departments or site level accreditation uh, processes that connect program developers with organizations delivering evidence based practice in order to improve quality. So there's many more. This is an exciting area for EPIS, and we really um, welcome folks. If you have uh, these uh, examples, please share them, write about them. Uh, I think the dynamic nature of implementation is something that we need to really emphasize and focus on, and bridging factors helps us address that. So, um, you know, I think I've addressed all these points. But you know, the operational of bridging factors were still developing and the methods for empirically de demonstrating relationships between bridging factors and outcomes is something that, that needs further development as well. So you know, when you think about applying EPIS in your setting, um, remember, you know, think across all phases, really think about sustainment from the outset. Um, you know, the characteristics of innovations to be implemented are important. We talk a lot about adaptation of those, but it's also adaptation of implementation strategies that's important. And think about those, not just interorganizational networks, but the relationships, the dynamic nature of implementation and how the, the EPIS framework could be helpful in thinking through those issues. 
And so with that, I just want to say thank you. There are some links here to uh, the EPIS Framework website, to our Implementation Leadership website. And with that, I think we can turn it over to our q and I believe that's what's next. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. We really appreciate that session you just led. As mentioned, if you have additional questions, please continue to put them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. So I'm gonna start out with our first question that has received the most upvotes, which is there's a lot of curiosity around when you might want to use EPIS rather than CIFR or another implementation model. Can you discuss some of the benefits or differences to EPIS? Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, this question comes up a lot, and especially with sort of folks early in getting into implementation science, there's so many frameworks, which one should I use? Um, you know, if you if you look at EPIS and CIFR, for example, you know, some of those constructs are very similar. So in EPIS, outer context, in CIFR, outer setting, uh, and the same, there's, you know, inner setting, inner inner context, there's uh, the process of implementation. I think for EPIS, what we've tried to do is lay out the process through those four phases to help, not just with conceptualization, but with actually conducting uh, implementation to think about what we do in each phase, who should be involved, um, what we wanna measure, uh, what our implementation strategies at, at each point. And I think that was illustrated in, in some of those uh, adaptations. So if you think about the JJ trials example, that project was very clear using EPIS uh, for measurement, using it for staging the implementation strategy. Uh, and it's the same for that slide that I shared uh, from Sarah Reith on the bridge collaborative, it clearly identified in the phases what was to be done, what those strategies were to be at each, each phase, uh, and how those differed or were similar across phases. Um, but then you can also link, you know, measurement of your implementation strategy in those phases. So it's a way to, to really think about not only the pragmatics, um, but also think about how your theory, so you know, when, when you have a project, you'll have a, a theory of change, a, your theory for your implementation strategy, how does that fit, what measurement is needed, what the strategy is needed, and how do you move across as you go forward? And that's where I think that um, you know, EPIS can be useful. You know, there are other process models to be considered as well. And so, you know, when it all comes down, you need to be thinking about which framework is most relevant for your project uh, in your setting at, at a given time. Um, for EPIS, we found a lot of flexibility, a lot of use in you know, different countries, different interventions, uh, different health systems. So there's a lot of flexibility there. And you know, we are excited about being able to track and um, really promote those kinds of adaptations as they're, as they're developed, as they're published, as they're um, thought about and happy to interact with folks in thinking about EPIS and its applicability. Thank you, that was really interesting. I know that there were several follow-up questions and I think you kind of hit them all in your explanation. Another question that is coming up is, can we employ qualitative and quantitative study approaches to identify the inner and outer settings factors, especially in preparation and exploration phases? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Uh, yeah, and we've, we've struggled with this. And in fact, in um, that dynamic adaptation project that I mentioned, we started off with a very lengthy quantitative checklist of, you know, 
outer, outer context, inner context, um, patient level, um, and sort of other levels in there. And we piloted it with some stakeholders at the organization and system level, and it was just too cumbersome. So we opted for a more qualitative approach, essentially a structured interview that took us through thinking about factors at outer context, factors at inner context, the needs of the population, uh, the issues of organizations and management. Uh, and that worked a lot better, but we've, we've done both. Um, and in some cases, you know, where we're thinking about implementation or trying to understand implementation, we've used, for example, a quantitative assessment to identify individuals. This was in a large scale implementation trial, identify individuals who, you know, were most in favor of the innovation or the evidence-based practice being implemented and the least favorable about it. And we used those data for our sampling strategy. So we used the quantitative data and then followed up with our qualitative assessment of both the most favorable and least favorable in that regard to help us understand the context and concerns. And I think it's it's best to do as much as you can in the exploration phase uh, in that regard so that you'll have the information you need going in. Great. That was, I think, a really excellent answer. And so, uh, again, keep putting in the minute. I'm gonna, we're going to get to as many as we can in the next 20 minutes. But the next question that has come up is, how do you think we can harvest adaptations made in one organization to benefit other adaptations? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Uh, so I like the idea of harvesting <laughs> adaptations because we've tried to do that in a number of ways. And um, you know, we have weekly team meetings, for example, during an implementation project, and we try to adapt um, uh, or understand our adaptations as we go. As we go. And I, I did a presentation at the Addiction Health Services Research um, conference a few years ago where I talked about um, dealing with chaos in implementation. Uh, and there are lots of unanticipated things that tend to happen. Uh, you know, you randomly assign people in organizations to conditions, but then, you know, someone who is assigned to the active condition is transferred to a team that's in the control condition. So we have a lot of learning from that. We have used that to document over 20 different, what we call chaos scenarios that uh, we not only have our responses to how we deal with it in the early, mid or latter part of a study, but also how we can use that information to help create covariates for quantitative analyses to help control for some of those unanticipated adaptations or changes. And some of those are just things you have to deal with. Some of them are actual adaptations. So for the adaptation piece and documenting that, it's, it's important to have a structure. And that's when I mentioned the, um, you know, the frame, which I see another comment about that here. Uh, and being able to say, you know, where did it occur? Was it outer context? Was it inner context? Who was involved? When did it happen? And you know, there are lots more levels and issues within, when, within frame, but then thinking about how do we tailor implementation strategies to be responsive to the types of adaptations or changes that may be coming in an implementation trial. So it, it is really dynamic and it's, um, you know, some of that we can prepare for in advance, but some of it may be unanticipated. So we, we really need to, you know, the better we can document, I think the better we can explain, we can you know, write about and publish about the experiences of implementation, but then also um, preparing uh, our implementation strategies to be as dynamic as possible. 
Thank you. So as you mentioned, there is a comment about the frame. So this seems like a logical next part where based on your explanation of the frame and your work with EPIS, are there validated scales or qualitative interviews for capturing adaptations during implementation that you know of? Yeah, so the, you know, the periodic reflections that I mentioned is one structured way that's been recommended. And sometimes that's paired with um, rapid assessment methods, rapid qualitative assessment, uh, in order to use those data in, um, in actually tailoring and adapting uh, what you're doing. Um, and I also think that you know, the framework group uh, keeps publishing and advancing our understanding of how to sort of fit what we're finding in terms of adaptations in that model. So right now, you know, I mean, we've used, you know, tried to use quantitative measures of, you know, how, how much is it adapted? Uh, you know, a little, a lot, you know, anywhere in between. But also one of the important things in thinking about adaptation of implementation strategies is, uh, you know, do we have good fidelity assessment for those implementation strategies. So how do we know when those implementation strategies are being done as designed? And how do we know when they're being adapted and changed? So that's somewhere that you know we've struggled with. You know, are we, you know, do we just get at what are the core elements? Did this happen? Yes, no, or do we want to know about, you know, if this happened, what was the quality? with which it happened. So it, it gets into that real decisional point about the pragmatics of fidelity, implementation strategy fidelity assessment. I'm not talking about clinical intervention fidelity, but the implementation strategy. How do we, how do we understand you know, how, well it, how well it was done um, and how burdensome the fidelity assessment process is? So in really understanding, I think if we have those fidelity metrics for a given implementation strategy or set of strategies that will help us document whether it's on course, off course, but then you wanna contextualize, you know, what were the reasons for that adaptation? How can we prepare for those reasons uh, and issues in the next study? And I think that's where either, you know, a weekly reflection or those longer term periodic reflections um, are essential to really understand uh, that adaptation and how it fits into something like frame. Really helpful. And that has been echoed that this has all been really helpful in putting all the pieces of the of EPIS together. And so there's just been a couple of people who have asked if you could provide a few more examples of using EPIS for process or as a process framework compared to a determinant or outcome framework. Right. Um, yeah, I think that if I'm interpreting that question, the real crux is, is EPIS a process framework or a determinant framework? And um, in the reviews that, it, that I've seen, it gets sort of pegged as a determinant framework and pays less attention to the process, but it is both uh, a process and determinant framework. And, um, you know, in our, we have a current NIDA trial implementing motivational interviewing and this really cool um, artificial intelligence uh, computational linguistics program for MI Fidelity and CBT Fidelity called LISSEN, L-Y-S-S-N. Uh, and we're simultaneously working on exploring the policy piece with policymakers of how policy can support implementation and sustainment of a quality assurance, an AI quality assurance platform, while we're working with the organizations in the implementation phase of actually implementing that and trying to provide feedback about the experience with implementing an organization to policymakers um, so they can consider how they think about quality of behavioral health services 
and could these technology platforms be useful um, at the funder and service system level? So that's, that's a complicated example where it's not just linear, but outer context is moving at a sort of different pace than inner context in that process. I don't know if that's helpful at, at all. Um, it, for us, it's really exciting to be thinking about those bridging factors and feedback loops that operate at different phases in EPIS. But when we talk about where we are with the implementation of MI and LISTEN, um, that's very clear. We're in the implementation phase. But at the policy, we're also clear that we're exploring that process. And our ultimate goal is to have those come together so that we can think about a policy strategy, you know, uh, or a policy implementation strategy that would lead to effective implementation and sustainment of innovations that are going to improve outcomes for, for people uh, with behavioral health problems. I think that was a very helpful example. So thank you for elaborating a bit more on the different types of uh, ways of using the EPIS framework. In addition to elaborating more, there is a question wondering if you can speak more to the distinction between bridging factors and outer context determinants. I can try to elaborate more. If there's, a, they're a little bit confused about what defines a bridging factor. In the talk, you mentioned bridging factors link the inner and outer context, but they're hoping you can speak more to that distinction. Yeah, I, I think some of the some of the issue with this is that some of it can be fluid, right? So you know, a determinant could be a policy that's set, but you could think about a policy as as a bridging factor. But I would think about you know how does the policy at the outer context, how does that become realized within the inner context? So I think we've all heard about, you know, unfunded mandates, for example. You know, so there may be a mandate to do something, but there's no funding to back it up. And so when I think of policy as a determinant, then I think about what, what's the mechanism by which it influences organizations. And often that may be through um, funding uh, that's available through, you know, formalized through contracting, as I mentioned, um, or it could be, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, uh, medication availability, you know, uh, an agency may say, well, we want to fund uh, medication assisted treatment for addictions, um, but perhaps the formularies that are available with the managed care organizations don't allow that. So the policy may be set, the bridging factor could be a change in formulary that allows organizations to prescribe, for example. So it, and I, I know this is probably not very satisfying, but it's one of those it depends uh, answers that we have to think about you know, what that determinant is how it gets translated. And that can be explored you know, quantitatively, but it can also be explored qualitatively um, in stakeholder perceptions of policy, for example, uh, or looking at the level of collaboration or the degree to which advocacy influenced uh, whether a policy is set. So there are examples of, of that as well. And that's a bridging factor that goes from inner context to outer context. So it really can be bi-directional. I, I could probably talk about this with you all for hours, but let's let, let's um, move on and see what else we have. Especially as Lisa, Dr. Saldana has mentioned, tomorrow they will she will be talking about how they use Epis as a prom process framework for most of her their work on their team. So that will be a really exciting connection between what we are just expanding on now and Great. tomorrow. So we'll continue to have that conversation. Uh, I, Jane, do you want to, Dr. Mahoney, ask a question? Mute. There you go. I'm on mute. It was just outstanding. I really uh, appreciate this uh, talk so much. Um, I'm thinking about 
this idea that adaptations that need to happen. Um, how do we understand the generalizability of those adaptations so that they could be used elsewhere? And kind of relating that to thinking about the EPIS framework for spread and scale up of innovations um, beyond a few organizations to many organizations. Yeah, well, the generalizability, I mean, that's all the always the million dollar question in a, a grant proposal or paper. How generalizable is it? That's really a function of your study design, I think. Um, well, I think there's two ways. One is you can look at you know adaptation as a feature of a, a project. And that's what we did with the dynamic adaptation process, because we felt that adaptations would be needed. We were working with counties in California for that process. And you know, um, Tulare County in the Central Valley is very different from San Diego County in mm -hmm. terms of population. And so adaptations that may have been needed in terms of work processes, uh, in terms of staffing uh, in, and, and other issues, while they may be somewhat unique uh, to those, I think the, I, I just think there are sort of common adaptations that we would think about like a family of adaptations yeah. around around workforce, around training approach, those sorts of things, um, and then specific. So there may be some general and specific. I, I have trouble answering that generalizability question around adaptations because they are by nature uh, dependent on the contexts in which you're working. So to the degree that contexts are similar, then you know those adaptations may be helpful. I think, you know, if you think about, you know, Teresa Betancourt's work in Sierra Leone, adapting the language of, you know, outer context, inner context to be more consistent with how, um, how people in Sierra Leone think about sort of groups of, of people or agencies, uh, that could be a very generalizable adaptation. Not that you would use that same language, but that you, the adaptation would be thinking about the relevance for the community that you're working in. And we've thought about this a lot in, you know, I've worked with Doug Novins, as, as I mentioned, he's at the University of Colorado, but also the um, American Indian Alaska Native um, Research Center. And there's a lot of discussions and collaborations about, you know, what, what's the meaning of sort of, you know, Western approaches, Westernized, clinical interventions and how do those fit with the cultural values of those American Indian communities and, and not all, but each community has its own perspective, its own traditions, its own history and culture. And so uh, in terms of adaptations, yeah, I think there are some general principles about the adaptation process, um, but those specific adaptations for a given setting may be um, somewhat unique. I mean, this is a great idea for a systematic review, I think. <laughs> but I wanna do another systematic review right now, but um, yeah, to, to really track that's a, it's a super interesting question, Jane. It is, and we only have two minutes left. So I noticed that um, there are several people who have asked if you could did you publish the chaos theories variables of study design? I noticed you had made yeah. a. Yeah, I saw that. Um, we are we have most of the paper drafted right now, getting hopefully submit before the end of the year. So, uh, we'll, we're we're getting to that. Excellent. So we'll all be looking out for that new information from you. We're excited for it. So I think that is actually all the time we have for Q&A right now. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Mandira and we're gonna go on a break for the next 15 minutes. So we will see you right back here, same link in 15 minutes. And we will have our, a panel with some lively discussions. We look forward to continuing in 15 minutes. Thank you.